For more than a hundred years, rugby union was the ultimate amateur sport, a spirit enshrined in the laws of the game. Over three turbulent months in 1995, the game would change dramatically and on 26 August, the International Rugby Board declared rugby union an open game and removed all restrictions on payments or benefits to those connected with the game. It did this as a result of years and years of players being paid under the table and the success of the 1995 Rugby World Cup in South Africa. The change in the game was inevitable. This is the story behind rugby turning professional. Rugby, as everyone knows, is a game played by gentlemen, but it wasn't always. In the early days of rugby football, the game was immensely popular with the working class in Northern England. The RFU was adamant though that the game had to be played purely for enjoyment and held on to its amateur rules. For players working in factories and in mines, this meant they needed to take time off from work to play the game from which administrators profited. The solution for a number of Northern sides was to pay broken time to players for the lost hours. The RFU found this unacceptable. Multiple meetings were held between Northern club officials and the RFU without any resolution. In 1895, many of the Northern clubs went off to found rugby league and that's how things more or less stood for the next 100 years. But of course, the world moved on. Professionalism was already creeping into the game by the 1980s and for years and years it was common knowledge that players in South Africa, New Zealand and Australia were being paid under the table but it was never vast amounts of money and not enough to sustain a life through playing rugby. In 1986 something unique happened in South Africa. With the All Black Tour of 1985 cancelled, the New Zealand Rugby Union made it clear they would not back an official tour to South Africa. What no one thought of was the fact that the All Black players could tour South Africa as individuals and in 1986 they landed in South Africa and called themselves the Cavaliers. This would be the first time that a sponsor would appear on an international side's jersey. The Cavaliers were sponsored by the Yellow Pages and the Springboks were sponsored by Toyota. Within the Springbok camp specifically, there was great unhappiness that the players didn't benefit at all from the sponsor being on the jerseys they played in. Playing rugby. And I must say, I think I'm carrying the feelings of the side here. When we first saw the jersey with that motor manufacturer's name on it, we all got quite a shock. A year later, New Zealand would win the first Rugby World Cup, which only elevated the sport's profile and would increase the pressure on the IRB over the next couple of years to make the game professional. Everything came to a head in 1995. In April of 1995, one month before the Rugby World Cup in South Africa, Super League was launched in Australia with financial backing from Rupert Murdoch's News Corp. Up until that point, Kerry Packer had a complete hold on Rugby League. This created an immense threat to rugby union as its players could now easily be lured to league as salaries were now suddenly two or three times they were before for professional players. Louis Leite, at the time the president of Sarfu, recognized the threat early on. We were worried about it, absolutely worried, that Super League could, could really harm rugby. I was worried. In the battle between Murdoch and Packer over rugby league, Packer's team saw the war as an opportunity to do exactly the same with Rugby Union than what Rupert Murdoch was doing with Super League. With that in mind, Packer started the World Rugby Corporation. Packer had done this before, of course, with World Series Cricket in the 1970s, when he bought up all the best players across the globe and stole the game from the ICC. Ross Turnbull, an ex-Wallaby prop, was appointed by WRC to recruit the best rugby players across the globe, a task he believed was a perfect fit for him. WRC's strategy was clear, target the best players in the world and keep it secret. They had to get the buy-in from players and have them believe in this professional rugby world before they could go into discussions with rugby officials. 
WRC saw the Rugby World Cup in South Africa as the ideal opportunity to recruit players as all the best players from across the globe were all in the same country at the same time. Turnbull only ever met with the captains and his first contact was with Francois Pinar, the Springbok captain. Pinar found the entire idea behind WRC fascinating and he agreed to act as an agent for them and sign up the rest of the Springbok team. During all of this happening behind the scenes, something remarkable happened on the rugby fields of South Africa. Rugby Union witnessed the birth of its first global superstar, Jonah Lomu. Lomu was unlike anything the rugby world had ever seen and he was the catalyst behind the increased interest from Murdoch to secure rugby. After Lomu's performance against England in the semi-final at Newlands, Murdoch phoned up Sam Chisholm, the executive director of News Corp and said, Who is that big fast fella? Get him. Within a couple of days, the deal was done. Louis Late flew to London to represent the unions of South Africa, Australia and New Zealand. After agreeing to an amount of $555 million, Louis Late signed on the dotted line with Chisholm and News Corp. On the eve of the Rugby World Cup final, the union executives of all three countries held a press conference to announce the deal, but they made the decision to deny that the players would be paid, unaware of what Packer was plotting. A day later, South Africa would win the Rugby World Cup at Alice Park and it probably elevated Rugby Union's value to way more than what Murdoch was willing to pay for it. Suddenly, the players were valuable commodities. The Rugby Unions had a contract with News Corp, but no contracts with the players. The fight to secure the players' signatures was on. After the World Cup final, Franz Pinar got his team together in a hotel room at Sun City and explained the finances and structure of WRC's proposal and all the players signed. The All Blacks would all sign upon their return to New Zealand and recruitment in Australia was also moving along swiftly. The rugby unions were trying to fight off the threat from Super League, but they were worried about the wrong enemy. In secrecy, the WRC was making significant progress in signing up the best players in the world. Around the time of the last Bledisloe Cup match between Australia and New Zealand in Sydney, the media was now openly reporting about the possible defections to a rival rugby organisation. For many players involved in this test, they thought it could be their last in national colours. In the post-match presentation, Phil Harry, who was in charge of the ARU, and Phil Coons, the Australian captain, both addressed the crowd and dropped subtle hints to the public that in fact, a rift in rugby was on the cards. That sort of spectacular, passionate game between two nations is something that money can't buy. To all the Australian supporters here today, we thank you. It's been terrific, your support. And whatever happens in the future, we hope that you and the union support us. Thank you very much. The union soon learned that all the top players had signed with the WRC and they realised they had to move very, very quickly to save the game and its traditions. In New Zealand, the strategy was to talk to every single player face to face and Jock Hobbs, who was a New Zealand rugby union councillor at the time, literally got in his car and drove to every player that was needed to explain to them in detail what the Super 12 and Tri-Nations would look like and to persuade them to stay with the Union. What was in the Union's favour was the fact that they did in fact have the money from News Corp whereas World Rugby Corporation was still in essence just a concept. Back in South Africa, money wasn't the issue, loyalty was. Late made it abundantly clear to his players that if they signed with WRC, the Springbok meant nothing to them and that was unforgivable. If they go to bed at night, they must think that they've sold out their countries by saying that they will go with, 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 uh, with uh, Turnbull. Because the New Zealand, the, the All Black didn't mean a thing. The Wallaby didn't mean a thing. The Springbok didn't mean a thing. To me, that's unforgivable. To ensure that all the players in New Zealand, Australia and South Africa were on the same page, a video conference was set up between the players, TV moguls and representatives from all three nations. Phil Kearns delivered the Australian players, then they switched to New Zealand and there was Sean Fitzpatrick with some of his players showing their commitment to WRC. Okay, we've got uh, 60 players signed, sealed and delivered. Uh, Everyone at the moment, I mean, the only point that we're reiterating to everyone is just that we've got to stay together and stick together and don't budge. Our position now is that we've rolled our dice, um, that we've said that we're into this, and we're, we're totally behind it. Then they tried to link up with South Africa, but Captain Francois Pinar was missing in action. The night before the video conference, Sam Chisholm persuaded Pinar not to go to the meeting, as they were prepared to put the same offer on the table as Kerry Packer. Pinar's absence sent a clear message and there was suddenly doubt in New Zealand that the box were on board. 
Without South Africa, it was highly unlikely that New Zealand would make the move, and without New Zealand, Australia would not make the move either. Phil Kearns was not a happy man. Oh, not happy. <laughs> not happy. Um... The fallout meant that Murdoch now had the upper hand, as the TV deal with the three unions was already signed and announced to the world. Pinar gave his players the assurance that the News Corp deal had real money behind it, while the WRC was still just an idea with lots of promises. Another ace up the union sleeves was the fact that they had already developed the concept of a Super 12 and Tri-Nations tournament, which made the offering so much more tangible to players. In New Zealand, the rugby union knew that if they could secure a couple of senior players, the rest would break rank as well. And that is exactly what happened in early August when Jock Hobbs's hard work paid off as a couple of star All Blacks signed with the union. I am holding letters from lawyers acting for Jeff Wilson and Josh Cronfeld confirming that these two All Blacks will sign contracts with the New Zealand Rugby Football Union. At a hotel in Midrand, the Springbok team got together in a room and each player had the option of either voting for the WRC or for the Rugby Union and the majority voted in the Union's favour. Back in Australia, Phil Kearns asked James Erskine, an ARU executive, to address the players at a hotel room in Sydney. Kearns' expectation was that Erskine would just give the facts on both sides and be impartial, but Erskine literally tore into the WRC and made it clear to the Wallabies that it would be foolish to sign with Kerry Packer. By this time, Ross Turnbull was dead in the water after players signed with the unions and the initial backing from Packer was floundering. But Turnbull decided to make an appearance on South African TV to address his doomed venture. What he didn't anticipate it was who would phone into the show while he was live on the air. Uh, we've got a surprise we'll caller on the line up. now, Mr. Turnbull. Louis Late has just called us. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Late, I can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, Ross, let me, let me just say to you, you couldn't prove to us that you had any $100 million or $200 million because that's what you will need. You need $52 million to just sign up the South African players. Uh, Ross, let me be very candid with you. I don't want ever to sit down with you. And I said, we don't want you here. We don't want you now, Rafi. Ross, go back to Australia. We don't need you here. Late won the legal and verbal battle, and WRC was dead for good. Say what you will about the current state of affairs in rugby. The fact is that this was the best possible outcome for the game. The players got the money, and the rugby union kept its long-standing traditions, so it was a win-win scenario for all involved. Over the next couple of years, players got bigger and faster and even more valuable commodities across the world. Competitions like Super Rugby and the Rugby Championship was massive success stories, but there is a general feeling that the time is right for some reinvention. The question World Rugby needs to answer now is where do we go from here?